So I'm very curious. Do you watch why or how you buy things? Like what makes you actually sign up? Is that something you pay attention to? Or is this just a me weird thing <laughs> that I like to watch why people buy certain things? And so today I thought we'd go through a quick case study of why I bought a course this week. And there's so many good secrets here that you can use. So let's get to it. Welcome to the Course Creators HQ Podcast, helping you navigate the latest techniques for creating and marketing online courses. And now, here is your host, Julie Hood. Hey, hey, so glad to have you here for episode 202. And we'll have the links in the show notes. Plus, I wanted to tell you, if you're listening to this when this episode released, it's July 23rd of 2024. It's the last chance for the drawing. And it's got over 4200 I think, dollars worth of prizes. Plus, you automatically get some free courses all you have to do is sign up so everybody who enters wins and then one grand prize winner gets the big uh, prize. So I'd love to have you and don't wait because by the time that you uh, sign up later, it's probably going to be closed. It's only through July 31st of 2024. So go to coursecreatorshq.com slash 200 drawing. Do that right now because if you wait, you'll probably forget. <laughs> so jump in. I hope you're the winner and that we get to work together because it's a huge package to let you jump into my coaching and work with me. So hopefully you'll be the winner. Okay, so today is such a fun episode, and I hope you enjoy it as much as I have enjoyed putting it together for you. And like I mentioned in the intro, I'm a little bit obsessed with paying attention to why people buy things, and especially when it's online, like what triggers them, what's, what's interesting, because then I can take those same sorts of secrets and carry them over to everybody I'm working with. And so this week, here's the kind of the history of what happened. So you have to understand the backstory for this to make sense. So it was on a Sunday and I wanted to take the bike rack off the back of my car and if you've ever done this, it's there's some logistics to it. And this is a pretty sturdy one. It's made for two bikes and then you can put on the extension and actually have four bikes. So this thing is significant. It is not tiny. And so it's, you know, 100 degrees here in St. Louis. And I'm messing with this, this thing and trying to get it unhooked. And there's like five different things. And so finally I got it off the car. I set it down in the driveway, bent over, picked the thing up and wrenched my back worse than I have ever done it in my entire life. Um, even when I was playing sports in high school to the point where I stood there for a second and was like, I don't think I can walk. <laughs> and luckily that went away pretty quickly. And I managed to kind of hobble in to the garage and I was getting ready to leave. And I thought, what am I going to do? This 150 pound bike rack or however much it was is sitting behind my car <laughs> and nobody else was home. And so I was trying to figure out how am I going to deal with this? So I managed to wobble in. <laughs> it had to be hilarious if the neighbors were watching grab a rolling trash can, <laughs> get that back out to the back of the car and kind of shove the <laughs> bike rack into the rolling trash can and roll it enough into the garage that I could shut the door and I could leave. <laughs> so here I am hobbling around and my back is just wrenched so bad. I can, I'm, I'm like, oh, what did I do? What did I tear? What happened? And then, so this went on for most of the day. And I later was, I could, thank God, I could sit and get to a place where it didn't hurt. I could get to a position where it didn't hurt. So it wasn't 24 seven pain, thankfully, because that would have been so, so bad. 
it was just when I would move, I was saying some rather colorful phrases. <laughs> but so I was sitting uh, at my computer. I think I was probably working on the Sunday night emails that you all get. And I was sitting there and got an email from Chris McKee, who is a nutritionist and a health coach. And I, I was, you know, I had been going through this. I'm like, I have not been exercising enough. My back muscles are super weak. So that's partly what caused the problem. Plus the way I bent over, you know, how you're supposed to use your legs. Didn't do that. Just bent over and pick the thing up. <laughs> so all this was going through my head. And she sends out an email talking about your gut issues and sort of related to having... Um, problems with your middle and your back and, and all this. And uh, so the number one first secret after this rather long story is that the timing was perfect. This email came into my inbox and I knew at that point, I'm like, I've got to do something different. I've got to get healthier. I've got to get stronger. You know, I've, I cannot keep up. I've got to do something different. So her timing was exquisite to have this email pop into my inbox. And I went back to look just to compare because I thought y'all might be interested and I was curious too. I have gotten 947 emails from her all the way back to 2016. And this is not the first thing I bought from her, but it was perfect timing. So that's the first lesson is the timing was perfect. And sometimes, you know, she had no control over me messing up my back and being ready to deal with my health issues. She had no control over that, but what she did have control over was the fact that her email popped up the same day I was like, I got to do something. <laughs> the second thing was years ago, probably back in 2016, when I first got on her email list, she had gotten a referral from one of my good friends who had told me how good she was, how much she knew, how helpful she was. So I knew already that she was very, very competent and that her content was good. I'd actually talked to her about coaching at one point and then it didn't fit into the schedule. So I knew her already. Plus I had that referral. So another secret there, can you ask your current students to be referrals for you if they come across people who would be good fits? So keep that in mind. Second secret, getting referrals. The third secret, the price was incredibly reasonable. It was almost the plunk down price. If you've heard me talk about that in the past, a plunk down price is where people will plunk down their credit card without having to think about it too long. And so it's a low enough price that it's not a big commitment that they have to pause and be like, should I spend this money or shouldn't I? Plus I was in so much pain. I was like, I've got to do something. <laughs> so the plunk down factor was there. It was, and the way they listed the pricing was also interesting. It was $97 plus $49 for four weeks of VIP coaching. So you could see this was really inexpensive for what we were getting you know, that's what, 130 some dollars for four weeks of coaching plus the program. So it was super reasonable. And while I don't want you to build your entire course business on these reasonably priced offers, uh, almost low priced offers, it is a good starting point to be having people have an option to jump in with you. Okay, number so that secret number three was getting the price point to be perfect and maybe having some lower price offers mixed in with what else you're doing. Depends on your business model and especially your audience. So there's a lot goes into that, but basically the price was right. We'll just call it that <laughs> as secret number three. Okay, then the next thing. And this one actually surprised me, but I did notice it. She had a super simple sales page. So it was a, a one page, had her picture on it, kind of talked through a little bit of what we were getting, but it was not very detailed. And that was fine because I was already sold. So I didn't need a 20 page sales page about this program 
and actually might have gotten frustrated because I didn't have a lot of time at that point. So think about ways that if somebody's ready to buy, can they buy, like go ahead and buy, or are you putting in a lot of hurdles for them that they have to read through the whole sales page to actually purchase from you? And once again, this is another nuanced kind of thing because especially when you're say, uh, selling a bigger type product, a uh, higher priced kind of thing, you do need to give more description. And I'm not opposed, I'm not saying I'm opposed to long sales pages. I'm just saying that for this particular situation that I was in with this low price point that I, she had already sold me from the email, that having a super simple sales page was brilliant because I'm like, done, where do I put my credit card number? <laughs> so that's number four, using super simple pages when it fits. Number five, and this one actually surprised me when I went back to go check on this today. I, number one, did not realize that she has been emailing me every day for the past year or two, something like that. I knew I got a lot of emails from her, but it didn't occur to me that I was like, wow, she is emailing every day. Because in general, I'm not a big fan of pestering people and emailing every day. But I will tell you, that was one thing that was happening. Um, also, there's so much here in this email section. So make sure you're taking notes on all of these things in case they could fit with you. The second thing was they use really good subject lines so that... Uh, and I was trying to figure out what the formula was. I'm like, her subject lines um, are very intriguing. And why is that? And so what they end up doing is they use a question and then a solution in the subject line. So specifically, the one that I saw was summer dress won't fit, question mark, cut gut dramas, which that's, you know, very good for, for lots of reasons. It's a very good subject line. But then I went back and I was searching through all of the emails that I had received from her and her team. And I realized this was one of the things, one of the patterns is they do a lot of question and then solution. So question, solution, like glaucoma, feed your optic nerve with salmon. Does your thyroid dysfunction ruin your weight loss? Beat it with seaweed. <laughs> and what I think is great about that is the question makes uh, a different section of your brain go, huh, does that apply to me? And then if it's a yes, then you want the solution. So maybe try with your emails, is there a way that you could use similar subject lines with some kind of question solution kind of thing? I'm going to start playing with that too. You will see that um, in some emails that are coming out to you. Okay. And then the other thing I was looking at the contents of their emails and trying to see, uh, you know, what kinds of things are they sending out? I knew I liked her stuff but I hadn't really analyzed what was in there. And so there's usually a short section of kind of a questioning and an imagining, consider what if kind of section, and then a call to action. So there's like three different parts. So the, the first part is the whole questioning and having you think about and imagine what your life could be like, how it could be different. And so there were phrases like, think about it, imagine, did you know? So lots of emotional kind of taking you to the place, especially for health, taking you to the place where you want to be as part of it. And then they, underneath that, the call to action, there were two main types of call to actions. One was a full blog post. So, you know, her blog posts are great, had lots of good content. And the other was a promotion with a big, bold button of sign up today. So not a little link down in the PS, a big, bold button <laughs> to sign up. So uh, another thing that I noticed, and this specifically stood out for me, so something else you can think about is 
there was one specific phrase in this email that just like jumped off the page to me (laughs) and said, imagine feeling like you're wearing an inflated inner tube around your midsection. (laughs) And when I, when I read that, I was like, yeah, that's kind of, kind of where we're at these days, (laughs) unfortunately. And it made me pause and it, it was very, you can see it's very visual and we got that imagined in there. I'm like, yeah. And that stuck with me too. So part of the reason when you're doing your marketing, part of the reason that we always are having you reword and redo things and rethink about your marketing is that we want you to reword things because you never know which phrase is going to jump out at somebody and actually have them stick around and take action from you. So spend your time reworking your marketing and coming up with new ways to say the same thing over and over again. Uh, Let's see. And then the last thing I noticed on the emails that I'll mention is she uses a really big font. (laughs) And I don't know, maybe it's because she's got an older audience that's the health situation or who knows why that is. But I was like, I wonder if that made any difference for me. And I know it definitely makes a difference versus a teeny tiny font that I have to word work too hard to read, but hers is like excessively large. So I don't know if that made a difference necessarily, but I was trying to notice like why things were standing out to me and the larger font was definitely standing out. It was more than your normal you know, 10 or 12, I think it was like 16 or 18 point pixel uh, font. And then, so that's number five is all of this stuff about how they do emails. And I'll put the link in the show notes so that you can go sign up for Chris's emails and, and study them and kind of see all these cool things that she's doing. Obviously do not copy, model them. So modeling would be the question answer in the subject line kind of thing, but don't use her subject lines. That's copying and that's no good, but you could model the concept of questions and answers in the subject line. And then the number six secret that I'll share with you that I almost didn't want to share, but I do think it was important. She has some really good graphics for her program. The The graphic design is very nicely done. And I like to think that that is not essential for your success. Like you don't have to have incredible graphics. I do think they have to not look like beginner. And so there's kind of this middle ground of incredible graphics that you can tell have been done by a designer. And then there's the okay kind of graphics in the middle that still look great. And then there's, and I know you've seen them, the really terrible ones that somebody has done that can't do graphics. (laughs) So try for as good as you can get. And I would say that Canva has really helped a lot of us up our graphics game and get to where we can have even better. And I'll be honest, I did not want to have this be one of the things that I mentioned to y'all because I don't want graphics to hold you back. So basically do the best you can. And then if you need to get some help from Fiverr and, and make them as good as you possibly can, let's put it that way. So I hope this episode was kind of fun for you. God, it went a little bit longer because of me telling the story and I hope you got some things that you will try out, some things that you will do from these six different secrets that Chris McKee gave me on how to sell online courses and group coaching. I thought she did such an incredible job. And don't forget to jump into the drawing. You only have a week left, so don't wait on that. Have an incredible week. Good luck selling and creating and marketing. I hope you have a wonderfully productive week and I'll catch you on the next episode. Take care. 